Yeah, I, I think um, maybe the, the way that this was said before that stuck with me the most, that Peter Kaufman said this, he's like, if, if you saw a child uh, who was seven and they didn't change between age seven and age 10, it would be a tragedy. It, like it'd be a very noticeable, painful, something, something is wrong. Um, but if you don't change between 27 and 30, it's almost expected. It's almost expected that adults don't change. And the people around us actually like almost subconsciously encourage us to stay the same. They want us to be predictable. They want us to, um, to not change too much because it's inconvenient for people around us and it's, it's hard and it's hard for us and you can only change so many things at once. And, and some of those are, um, that, that sticks in mind to me. I was like, if you don't change, it's a, it's a tragedy. There's always something you can, you can grow. There's always something that's going to be important to add. There's always, you know, your context is changing, even if what the system and the self that you had was perfect for, you know, where and who you were at 27, where and who you are at 30 is going to be different. And you've got to change and grow mm. and adjust to that. Eric Jorgensen, welcome to the Ranvi Show, brother. Thanks for having me. It's good to be here. I appreciate it. So, uh, you know what? Usually I run people through who I'm having on the show, but you've got a very interesting profile and I'd kind of like you to introduce yourself to the audiences. And I'll also tell you this, uh, our audience loves it when uh, Americans primarily are on the show because you guys are like fantastic conversationalists. I don't know why. I think it's something in your culture. I don't know what it is. But you guys can hold conversation with anyone. So yes. that's what Indians pick up from you. But go on with your introduction. I, I think the same of Indians. You got that most excellent, like high energy question asking, like curious culture. I love it. I love it. every time I get to talk to an Indian man, I'm like, yeah, this is the best. Um, so I'm, I'm glad to be here. Um, this is uh, this is kind of the culmination of like a few years of side projects for me. So like I started, uh, came up in an entrepreneurial family. And like, you know, my dad ran a small business that my grandfather started, my uncle ran a pizza shop and a newspaper. And so I was the kid like selling candy out of my locker and getting in trouble for that <laughs> and like giving kids rides to school for money and like just always kind of hustling and finding ways to, to put it all together. Um, in college, I started- Are you, are you Jewish? No, no. Uh, what, what, where's, what's your family's ethnicity? Uh, we kind of like Nordic, I guess, like Scandinavian on one side and British on the other. Nice. But, nice. Yeah. We've been, um, we've been in America as, as, as long as I can, you know, trace back. Um, so <laughs> it's been, uh, but yeah, we, we got a little, uh, so I, I was just like, got in the startup world really like in college, uh, started building websites, mm. like tech was getting big. Facebook was growing like crazy. And I was like, thought I was going to be the next Mark Zuckerberg. And so got into tech that way and been in startups for like 10 years and, just building stuff on the internet. Is the tech scene in the American startup world always an exciting place to be in? Like from the outside, it looks like you guys are always planning for the future. And this is like a historical kind of uh, outlook on things. Like we had Steve Jobs creating computers, Bill Gates creating computers, then you have Mark Zuckerberg creating the next wave. So is it exciting on the inside right now as well? Yeah, I think it's I think it's kind of always exciting. I mean, like tech just gets to choose whatever is exciting and then like redefines it as tech, right? Like tech, it seems to be mm. always the frontier, right? So, you know, 40 years ago it was computers and then it was the internet. And now it's, you know, you could say tech is crypto and bio and, you know, self-driving and like whatever is the frontier. Um, and, and there's kind of like in the valley, whoever's working on like almost the farthest future thing is is like gets the most street cred you know um so like you can oh, wow. you can be really successful by building something successful or you can be successful by like you can be at least perceived as exciting by doing something like so far out in the future and crazy that like nobody else hardly even knows what you're talking about um and it might not be a successful company because maybe you're too early but it's at least like really interesting to people to learn about and hear about like what's going on right um so you spoke about bio you mean biohacking right yeah, I mean, biohacking, health, um, like the the whole, there's there's bio kind of in a few different directions, like around climate change, 
around genetic testing, around like, I'm, I'm far from an expert on this. I just know enough to know that like, there's really exciting stuff happening that I don't understand any of in a few of those different directions. Um, I mean, it's a revolution around like, um, sort of self-measured healthcare. And so um, like continuous glucose monitoring with levels is just coming out and, you know, the Apple Watch gets it ever more advanced. And so this feedback loop of like measuring yourself more and more intensely and understanding more and more about like good health markers and how, you know, our diet and exercise and habits like feed into those is super interesting. Beautiful. Um, so, you know, when you yourself are a techie, if you're someone from the tech world, you have a much clearer outlook of things. Uh, and uh, you've, you've kind of made your own mathematical formulas in your head about what the world will possibly look like 10 years from now. So according to you and according to what you've seen, what can we expect in 2030? And the reason I ask you this is because I remember back in 2002 or 2003, touch screens on phones became a thing. And that was fascinating for me as a nine year old kid. And I looked at that and I was like, okay, wow, this is so futuristic. Seven years later, the iPhones like become a worldwide sensation. Screens are way bigger. You know, three, four years after that, big screens become affordable for like third world country populations. So yeah. what can third world country populations expect in 2030, which they're not expecting right now? Yeah, I, I think uh, Josh Wolf from Lux Capital has talked about like th this next trend being technology getting smaller and smaller and closer and closer to us. So in the same way that like touchscreen phones were really exciting, now we kind of have like AirPods and a watch and these like the phone is almost disappearing, voice is getting better and better. Um, the, the systems are getting smarter and smarter. And so they're able to kind of intuit more. And so it's, um, you know, I think we may be reaching peak like amount of time staring at our phones um, and be getting better and <laughs> better at uh, technology, like complementing our experience and kind of working around what's happening. And, um, you know, people are getting, the phones are getting really good at delivering dopamine, um, but we're also getting more and more mm. at, uh, good at saying like, I don't know if this is healthy for me to just stare at this tiny screen, like right in front of my face for 14 <laughs> hours a day. Um, and people are realizing how good it feels to like sit and talk to someone in person and be a part of more physical events. And so like the technology kind of recedes and supports that a little bit more than, um, than defines it now. And, um, I mean, I think the health trend that we talked about, it, it, like people are going to get, we're realizing how individual health is and how individual everybody's circumstances are. And we're going to get better and better at providing like very personalized, um, experiences in, in health and in medicine and things like that. Um, so those are, those are at least two of the trends I'm, I'm seeing now. Beautiful. So it, everything's becoming more inward. Do you say that? Like everything's becoming like more within. Yeah. It, closer and closer to just like, um, I mean, like we, we used to have a computer sitting on a desk and now we have a laptop and now we have a phone that's like always in our pockets and that's moving to like AirPods that are in your ears. And so eventually you can imagine this being like a transplant, uh, like something that goes in your, you know, um, like an implant in your ear that can just play sounds automatically right. or a contact lens that is like in your eye or um, something that is like similar to an Apple watch. Uh, you know, I've seen tech that can like, that is almost invisible, um, but it can, mm. you, it can be much more manipulated. And so like just by moving your fingers and wearing a bracelet, you can like have a full keyboard. And because it looks at like the nerves that's on your, in your forearms and sees what's moving and it can measure that. And so it, t the tech is just getting smaller and smaller and closer and closer to our bodies. Wow. Okay. Beautiful. Like, um, that's some black mirror shit like right there. Yeah. Have you seen black mirror? Oh yeah. Yeah. That stuff is spooky. Um, but it's uh, like truth enough based that you're kind of like, uh, yeah, I can see that happening. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and I, th I think you know black mirror i mean for all the listeners who've not checked it out please go check it out uh, especially if you're someone who's business oriented it'll just open up your mind in terms of possibilities but here's what i love about black mirror that it highlights the possible negative aspects of what can happen due to the positives and um someone else who does that is this author called yuval noah harari the guy who wrote sapiens yeah. uh he always highlights the negative aspect of the positives as well uh, and his third book is the one I started reading first, which is called 21 Lessons mm. for the 21st Century. And he spoke about nanobots. He said that, okay, beyond what Eric just spoke about in terms of contact lenses and airports, the next stage after that, so probably in the 2030s or the 2040s, will be these tiny robots that actually can be in your bloodstream and they can help fight disease. They can spot 
uh, even like the smallest cancer cells when they begin to form. Like basically, cancer is like a multiplication of cells that you don't want multiplied. So when that nanobot is in your body, it'll spot cancer cells multiplying and it'll destroy those first few cells so that they're not able to multiply. Uh, or you know, it can just track. all kinds of data within your body everything from your zinc levels to your uh, vitamin levels to your minerals everything possible and therefore create like a chart and predict how healthy you are what possible diseases you're prone to is there anything related to nanobots that you're familiar with that's happening in silicon valley right now uh i mean the one i can't believe i didn't think of for my first set of examples is, is neuralink um that Elon Musk is working on and so that is like either nanobots or technology in, in your actual like neurons in your brain that turns your brain a little bit more into something programmable or affectable or controllable um and and there's a awesome um series called uh it starts with nexus um by this futurist named Ramez Nam it's like a sci-fi series it reads like a movie it's an awesome awesome book but it's all it's like maybe 2040s and 2050s based on the neuralink technology and things wow. before neuralink was even founded i mean he wrote these like 5 or 10 years ago um but it's a really cool yeah. kind of like what becomes possible when the brain becomes programmable you know it, it effectively become superhuman when you can like write programs and change your responses to things become more rational become more uh tolerant of pain like tune up your reflexes like it's it's crazy and it's really fun like near future sci-fi so So uh Eric could you explain Neuralink Elon Musk's Neuralink to a 4 year old who's listening to this podcast not that there's 4 year olds listening to this podcast but uh you know what what's your simplest explanation of it Yeah it, it, so turning your brain into programmable hardware I I think is the like um controlling like the way the way that Elon Musk puts it is um reducing the latency between like your brain and the real world Um so if you can type at 100 words a minute that is a like data transfer mode of however many megabytes per second and if you can actually like turn the brain into hardware and make it extensible so that you can automatically connect to the internet or download information faster than you can read it faster than you can listen to it faster than you can um and export faster than you can type or speak all of a sudden your like the feedback loop between what your brain can do and what the you're affecting in the world is much much tighter um and it's it's i mean crazy the implications of it are pretty uh wild i mean you get through like one or two interviews with him i'm far from an expert under a link uh, i just think it's like a cool thing to learn about and listen to and um it fantasize about i think anybody who's like close to the science would say it's still like a ways away um so i don't think you have to like worry about this in the near term but like in our lifetimes it's It's one of those things that Elon Musk likes pushing on. It's like, ah, there's no f- reason why the physics aren't possible. It's just really, 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 really hard. And so if we just start like working on the problem, um, you know, maybe 20 years or maybe 70, um, but but we make it closer to it. Yeah, that's why Elon is such a fascinating inspiration for so many entrepreneurs all over the world. He just takes on these difficult problems and says, "You know what? Let's try it. Let's see where it goes." um you know but even with the neuralink when you when you think of all the positives there's so many um uh applications of it for example if you want to get more disciplined in life probably there'll be some kind of app in the neuralink which will help you get more disciplined or if you want to stick to a diet or if you want to become more punctual you can actually change the way you are as a person to benefit those around you and to improve your own capabilities have you seen this movie called limitless with bradley cooper yeah yeah uh it's it's so for the listeners it's basically uh, a movie where he takes this pill which kind of expands the capabilities of his brain so he becomes smarter faster uh nicer and he just gets more shit done in life so within a month he becomes one of the country's top stock brokers he tries becoming the president in the movie lots lots of things happening but uh, eric i think you were saying something about elon musk right now that's why i interrupted you uh yeah well i think it's just interesting that he like the the mental model that he uses of like is there any reason in the physics why this isn't possible like if no then let's try it L- then let's at least see mm. working on the problem it, like it almost doesn't matter to him how hard it is it just matters like is it possible and if it is possible like he'll push on it and he'll work on it and he'll like um you know getting to mars seems so like infinitely huge of a problem and getting hardware into our brains like seems so infinitely complicated of a problem that most people wouldn't even try it and i love his attitude of just right. like why not like 
there's only one way to make progress. So, like, yeah. you got to start chipping away at it. Let's see what we can do. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, so that that's the issue with Asia in general. Asian countries don't, like, people are kind of taught to aim just for stability. People are taught to kind of limit their own thought processes. But because of the internet, because of globalization, because of podcasts like this, American mindsets and American schools of thought or international mindsets and international schools of thoughts are kind of making their way into an Asian teenager's head. And it kind of mm. opens up your possibilities. Like when I was a teenager, no one told me that you could become a content entrepreneur. But then once you actually get to it, you realize, oh shit, this was possible. Why didn't anybody just give me that little bit of hope? Um, so I, I mean, that's, that's kind of the intention behind this podcast as well. Uh, and that's that's my next question to you. You're someone who studied Naval Ravikant in detail. Now, Naval Ravikant is someone who Indians look up to a lot because you know when when an Indian sees another Indian doing well on an international stage, you're like, hey, that's 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 our guy. <laughs> yeah. That's our guy. That's that's the emotion. Uh, but we will get to Naval. The question I want to ask you is generally in Silicon Valley, on a very human level, what kind of mentality difference do you notice compared to the rest of America? Because you've stayed all over. You grew up in Detroit. You're in Kansas City right now. But what differentiates those guys? Why are they? Why are those guys there? I mean, Silicon Valley has uh, like a lot of interesting stuff going for it, which is one is like the smartest and most ambitious people all around the world select to move to Silicon Valley, right? Like that is almost like a credential on its own. It was like, did you go, you know, live there for a while? That's less true now, maybe, and going forward than it was. Um, just because, why, why like, do you why do you say that? Well, there's so much more that happens in like in the cloud, right? In the internet, there's so it, it, like the information is so much more accessible. The relationships are so much more accessible. Um, you know, like crypto, especially like in the last few years has happened very, very, in a very, very distributed way. Um, and so some of those things, like some of the frontiers are happening more and more on the internet and the, you know, this work is all more meritocratic, you know, in, you know, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, even you had to kind of go there and build a physical relationship with someone to build credibility and build trust. And that's just less true. Now you can build, you know, if you're checking in great code and into open source projects, you know, on GitHub, like you can build a reputation, you can build, um, you can build credential on Twitter or through podcasts or through blog posts in a much more real way um, than you used to be able to. Like, it, I don't think things are dependent on being co-located anymore now that the tools are there and now that we're used to trusting people on the internet and evaluating like proof of work, essentially. like. You can look somebody up online and see that they're a valuable contributor to an ecosystem or a community and start working with that person. You know, I know people who've co-founded companies with people they've never met in person. Like that is, you know, I, I never met Naval like to write this book. We never even talked live. It was all email and us just kind of like seeing each other for who we were through the internet. Um, and it, that, that, so that is more true than it's ever been. Um, I, I think that Silicon Valley culture extending, um, be, being like kind of extensible through the internet is, is amazing because it, it provides all of this sort of, um, it creates a context for innovation and ambition, you know, just like you're talking about, this is, um, it, it's very accepting of failure, you know, like you can have, you can fail. And as long as you were faithfully executed a plan, faithfully executed, like with good intentions, as long as you took on a great vision with, with kind of like great intentions, um, you're not doomed if you fail. Like you, it is expected that over the course of a career, an entrepreneur will have some wins and have some losses. A developer will ship great projects and shitty projects and designers will do great work and, and crap work. And that's just part of aiming really high and trying to do like great, huge things is that sometimes you're going to fall short. Sometimes you're going to miss the mark. And that's part of the game in Silicon Valley. Um, and it's becoming part of the game on, on like the frontier and, um, an acceptable piece of innovation that, you know, is, is a tradition and maybe uh, something that wasn't as true 50 years ago or wasn't as widely accepted, but the returns of that are getting more and more obvious. And so we're seeing more and more of it. Um, and I love like, you know, what you're doing and what we're doing here to kind of help share that message. Cause I think it's really easy to, to um, miss that and to miss the opportunities because of that. Like the cost of downside, the, the downside of failure is much lower and the cost of, or the upside of winning is much higher, you know, than it has ever been. And, and that's just going to keep being more true, I think, as the leverage gets longer and as markets get bigger uh, for all of these things. 
Right. You said something super interesting uh, right now about Twitter. And you said that how you connected with Nawal over the internet. Um, you know, how does Silicon Valley look at Twitter and LinkedIn? Do they actually scan people's profiles and say that, okay, you know, this is someone I can work with or this is someone I vibe with. So, uh, I mean, because I'll tell you why. The, the, the image that Indians have about Twitter is that it's extremely political, extremely right-wing versus left-wing, and that's why people stay away from it. And I'm sure that there's a section of Americans as well who think the same way, that, oh, no, Twitter is too political, so I'm not going to be on it. But then there's this whole entrepreneurial side of Twitter with everyone who's following Naval, pe following people like yourself, following people like, you know, like, I don't know, all these like thousands and thousands of self-help um, and, and amazing self-help accounts, not those cliched ones. There's... There's gold on Twitter and I feel people don't utilize it enough. So how how is Twitter and LinkedIn looked at in that world? Yeah, I mean, Twitter is um, Twitter is huge. Uh, for, it has been for me in my career personally. I think I think any platform can work for you if you if it is a fit for who you are and the kind of content that you want to produce. You know, I'm, I'm not an Instagram guy, I'm a Twitter guy, and that has worked for me. Some people are Instagram people or Facebook people or LinkedIn people, and that works for them. And you can build a community on any platform. Um, I think uh, Twitter has, has political pieces, but it's also like an incredibly huge and diverse platform. And then millions of people sharing their own expertise. And it, it takes work to build the Twitter that you want, right? Like there is not one Twitter, there's, there's one Twitter for each of us and we create the kind of feed that we want. Um, and we have to be very deliberate about choosing the people and the voices and the information that we want as our inputs, because we can't trust your inputs. Eventually, like you become those inputs and you, you have to kind of, um, you end up losing trust of your own judgment and losing sight of who you want to be. And so these like, you have all these algorithms around you, like the Twitter and Facebook right. and YouTube. And like, if you don't push back against what they're trying to push, on you, like you've got to work really hard to curate those inputs and to be sure that you're choosing the right voices to let in your head because that becomes who you are. You know, like hundred percent. You you you're, you're referencing social dilemma here, right? Like uh, the whole social dilemma concept. Yeah, I and mean, you got three million followers, and every one of them has like opted in. <laughs> subscribers on YouTube. I don't even know what you are on the other platforms. Like every one of them has opted into choosing like your curation and your taste and they trust you to bring them people and insights and wisdom from you know wherever you can find it and that's huge in the same way like people who want to build a great twitter for themselves and have these like really valuable inflows of information like it can be a huge tool but you have to put in work to curate it and teach it what you want and find great people and build relationships off of them right um, you know, that so much good has come from, for me from there. Um, but it's also, you know, Same. I spend a lot of time on it. I, I almost can't help but spend time on it. Um, but, but that is like something I enjoy doing and, uh, I've, I've benefited from it. It's, it's made me a lot of who I am. Yeah. I'd, I'd like to, uh, also mention that it's probably a precursor to Neuralink in many ways, Twitter, just mm -hmm. your Twitter feed. You can, you can become the people that you follow. And the thing is, I really like that you highlighted the fact that you need to be a dynamic user of Twitter in terms of you need to actively follow and unfollow people and shape up your own mind through the people that you're following and unfollowing. That's like a fantastic insight. And that applies to every single social media platform. Um, yeah. yeah, we're also seeing like just generally with social media in India. Um, so I'm 27, born in 93. I speak to people who are born in like 97 or 99 and they're extremely different from what I was when I was that age. I speak yeah. to people who are born in 2003 and they're even more different and in, 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 in some bad ways, but mostly good ways. And the good ways is that they're, they're primarily way smarter, like they're way smarter, way more aware of the world. Um, and you know that what that means is that content creators who don't reinvent uh, and this could be content creators on Twitter, it could be YouTube, it could be Instagram, whatever, rapidly fade away. The mm -hmm. game of content is very much like an athlete's career where you know that there's going to be a shelf life. And unless you add a three point shot, unless you learn how to rebound, unless, you know, at every, like how I keep referencing LeBron James on this podcast, every year he adds something to his game, even in year 17, in year 18, he learns yeah. something about what he can do to improve. Content is very much the same and it's not everyone's uh, cup of tea to keep reinventing often. 
so the world of content is pretty brutal but on the flip side i feel like we're heading into a much smarter world and if you are someone who can keep up with the reinvention process you can become one of those kings in that smarter world 10 years from now there's something super interesting in there i think which is uh, i read that the size of generation gaps are actually shrinking as technology in it, like the pace of technology increases and so every it used to be every 10 years like technology was different enough that the minds that it shaped were different and now it's maybe every five or every three and so like people who come up natively with you know Airtable and Notion and Roam and just start using them fluently at 16 is very different than somebody who's you know 40 who has to like relearn with high effort all these tools and put them on old mental maps and somebody who comes up with like Bitcoin is just their native currency because they're doing business on the internet before they're doing business anywhere else um, and so those things are like really interesting and I think young people underestimate maybe the advantages that they have by being like absolutely fluent in new technologies just by the mm -hmm. virtue of when they were born and, and what they've kind of learned and done already uh, it was something I underestimated certainly when I was like you know in my teens and 20s yeah uh, I mean do you do you think that these are the kids who are going to create those artificial intelligence startups and those Neuralink style startups and this is the kind of training that they're getting for that hyper futuristic world which will also possibly bring with it some negative aspects like Black Mirror like what you all know Harari says so while I'm hopeful about that generation of kids I am kind of concerned as well what do you think yeah I think technology is is always used for good and bad you know um that, that's something that is actually like pretty uh well explored in that nexus series I mentioned like there's good and bad uses for you know every technology that's ever been invented you know fire cooks food and it burns down buildings and you know right. knives are used to like make rafts and to kill people and so like I think the um, almost all technology, you know, this is not a well-considered opinion, but I think almost all technology and certainly technology as a whole is like, has more good uses than bad uses, but it's defined, you know, by the people who use it. Um, we, mm. we, we, as long as we remain, you know, ethical and united as a species and aware of what we're doing to each other and the world around us, like technology is a tool for, for good. Um, and people are vastly more good than they are bad. Um, you know, yeah. That said, we might accidentally like create some sort of apocalyptic AI event. I'm not an expert on it, um, but <laughs> if anybody's working on AI, go read like Eliezer Yudkowsky and just like make sure you're not going to end the world before you, you know, flip the on switch or something. Um, yeah, in, in terms of, uh, you know, books about the future or books about where the world of technology is at, do you have any recommendations for the listeners? Yeah, I love reading sci-fi. I mean, that's, um, they say like sci-fi is the, the proving ground for the whys of technology. Um, and so that's, you know, I've been reading sci-fi since I was a kid and it's like, makes it really fun to think about like what could happen, what are the first and second and third order implications of what could happen. Um, so everybody has their own taste in sci-fi. I like kind of like near future stuff. I love the three body problem. I loved um, Nexus. I like, uh, the Bobaverse, uh, We Are Bob, and like that whole series I just read. Um, you know, they, they read like movies and they're just really fun. Like, this guy becomes like an AI satellite on his own and just like it's shot out into space to go like figure it out and become self replicating. And like, it, it's a super fun, super fun kind of like easy read. Um, but yeah, I mean, find, find whatever stuff is interesting to you and like dive into it. You know, you can learn as much from, from fiction as from nonfiction, I think, about leadership and technology and um you know psychology and everything that you need to beautiful uh i gotta ask you about silicon valley once again i have a couple of questions um the first question is that you know there's this misconception that you have to learn how to code in order to be a part of silicon valley and the second question i mean so is that true and the second question is uh that with remote work becoming a big thing after the pandemic happening after coronavirus. Uh, do you think it's possible for like a really smart Indian designer slash coder slash entrepreneur to be a part of Silicon Valley while they can sit in India or anywhere in the world? Uh, how does Silicon Valley on the inside look at this outward situation? So I, I think, um, let me start with that, that first question and, and see if I answer all of them. Um, so I think, 
you do not have to learn to code. Um, but if you are detail oriented and engineering minded and mathematically inclined and you know, uh, that can be the right path. Um, that what, what do you, what do you mean by that? Like, what do you mean by like, could you expand a little bit on that? Yeah. I mean, great, great engineers tend to be like, uh, detail oriented and patient and like system thinking. And like, I, you know, that does not drive with my personality as much. Like I am very like get to 80% done as quick as I possibly can and then go on to the next thing. Um, and I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm more oriented towards language than towards math. And I have been since I was like, absolutely a kid, like I can do math, but like, I don't relish it. Um, and so some of those things are just like, don't feel like you have to learn to code in order to be a part of the valley. If you have gifts that are more, you know, if you are a great visual designer, uh, if you see and have better taste and have better kind of like spatial relations, maybe you may make a better designer. If you are great at relationships and very outgoing, you get energy from people, you may be better at sales. Um, you know, th there are not infinite ways to be, to like add value to a tech company, but there are definitely more than just learn to code, right? Um, mm. Code, design, and sales are probably the biggest three pillars, I would say. Um, but but there are many, you know, companies are big. There's many jobs to do, and, and there's probably a unique job for you if you're just looking to like, how can I put a label on myself and like be great at this thing and get in the door and, and start working and getting paid. Um, you know, there's mm. coding is a great one, but there are there are more um, on the list, I would say. Um, what was the other question? Oh, is it possible the sec for second? Yeah, the yeah. remote work. Yeah, remote work. Like, a absolutely. I think, um, you know, we, we have been hiring like people increasingly remotely and increasingly just like merit based, like doesn't matter where they are or who they are, as long as they can do the job and do it well. Um, it does rely on having a portfolio of work. It does rely on showing that you can do what you can, you know, that you can actually like have the good skills and deliver on what you say you will and um, all of those things. But but you can become a part of a community and build, you know, your, your proof of work and show off your skills and, you know, I think become increasingly like a part of the, you know, online Silicon Valley community. Um, and that's more accessible to people around the world now than it has ever been before. Um, it just, you know, it takes learning where people are hanging out, whether that's Twitter or Hacker News or, you know, Product Hunt or whatever, and just like being a part of that community and learning the the patterns and the work and the language and every community kind of has its own um, set of, it, like its own subculture, right? And so like learning that subculture and um, showing showing your value to it, um, you know, is a, is a great formula for, picking up jobs and getting offers and um, just starting to work with people and build trust. And uh, you never know where that kind of stuff is going to lead. So it's basically, you need to have some work experience, like a portfolio of your work. And if you have some kind of digital presence, like on Twitter or LinkedIn or Reddit or whatever, that would help. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. And it, they don't have to be higher jobs. I would say previously, it's just, you know, um, show that you can do what you're offering to do, you know? Um, so like if somebody, I had somebody reach out to me today and was like, hey, I'd really love to help you, you know, with this project that you're talking about doing, like. Be I, be careful, be careful <laughs> saying that on this podcast, <laughs> but go on. <laughs> this is generic <laughs> advice for anybody who's listening uh, to reach out to anybody else. Um, but it's, it is like, if you show that you can, that you understand the context, that you understand the, what you uh, sort of can, like you've already contributed, that you already have the skills needed to contribute and that you can get there from here. Like that, like there is plenty of people with, um, who, who the skill for them is like putting together talent with opportunities and putting all those things together. Like that is a huge, um, that is a huge skill on its own, but it takes, someone showing initiative and showing the skill and showing that they want to contribute and have already. Uh, but if all you can do right now is like build projects on your own, they don't even have to be real. Like, you know, if you want to prove that you're a designer, start redesigning homepages, post them somewhere publicly, start tweeting about it, you know, or whatever your version of that is. Um, like show, show the work, show the skill, show the interest, um, and, and the opportunities will present themselves.
Yeah, I just got to highlight a personal story of mine here. Um, so we we're running a media business, and we're, we're consciously always on the lookout for great hires. Uh, last year, there was this kid who basically kept landing up at our office, and myself and my co-founder, we weren't at office uh, in in at those moments where he landed up there, uh, and he wasn't from Bombay. He was outside. If he was from this place called Jabalpur, which is a smaller town in like central India, so it's pretty far from here. And he kept coming to Bombay to meet us, and we weren't, uh, you know, we didn't end up meeting him. So uh, this dude, he studied my life entirely, my co-founder's life entirely, and he created an Instagram feed, okay? And he he listed out everything about my parents, the girls I've dated, my work experience. um what we're doing with the podcast right now then he made sections on that instagram feed about uh each podcast he broke down each podcast he edited each video and that was his job application yeah he was a 19 year old engineering college student and my my entire team sent in that page to me and i i saw i saw design skills i saw editing skills i saw content based skills and we got him on for an internship did fantastically well for 6 months he called i mean then after at this point i was talking to him on the phone i was guiding him a little bit with his content and he told me that he wanted to drop out of engineering college but since i know that he has this natural skill set in the world of content and i also know that that's translatable to the world of entrepreneurship like you can take those same skills and create an entrepreneur out of that he's he's working with us now so he left his house he ran away from his house he ran away from his parents which is a huge deal in india yeah. like we we live with our parents throughout our life i live with my mom and no one does that usually he dropped out ran away and he's he's staying in my office right now we built out a room for him and he's going to head our content division probably 5 years down the line that's awesome and that's that's just like yeah one one story of um you know if if you if you really want a job you got to prove it you got to like put it out there you've got to show that you're capable of doing something and it makes your chances of getting that job way higher So there's a lesson in there for like the listeners. Yeah, that's huge. I mean, and and I would say like he didn't just show you his skills, but he showed you his hustle. He showed you that he put hours and hours and hours into that application that you call it, right? Into that project to show you how much he cared about that, you know, that particular thing. Um that's that's huge. It's really huge, especially earlier in yeah. your career where you don't have, you know, you don't have much of a resume already, but you can create, you know, you can work so hard and put so much into it and be so considerate about who the person is that that is a perfect example which is why i want to ask you about nawal why did you you know choose to write that book the almanac of nawal ravikant what what was your thinking behind it you know if you google your name that's the top suggestion in india at least uh it's eric jorgensen space nawal so what got <laughs> into you and, and you know the things you say i mean i'm sure you've studied the guy inside out and there's this saying in the world of yoga that if you want to gain another human's traits you study that person you think about that person possibly create something related to that person and you're able to inculcate some of their traits it's not really a yogic theory it's basic uh human science like you know if you think about someone i really like lebron james i study his career inside out possibly subconsciously i apply certain things in my own business that he did when he was my age or younger so i want to ask you about nawal what what about that guy fascinated you so much that you went and wrote a book on him yeah i mean i've been following nawal for more than 10 years probably um and when i was you know young and trying to find my way to silicon valley that that was like one of the first things i heard was like go read all of paul graham and go read all of the stuff that nawal is sharing on on his old blog venture hacks um and so to me he was kind of like if you want to understand the value if you want to get into it like this is what you have to read um and so that's when i started following him and kept up on on twitter and listened to his talks and his podcast over the years and like like seen you know everything that he has shared uh, along different stages like has been stuff that i've been interested in so you know he's he's like a sci-fi futurist like i'm into sci-fi and futurism like he got deep into like crypto and blockchain like that stuff is really interesting he talks about building startups and investing and kind of principles for wealth building that are generalizable he talks about you know philosophy and and you know the study of happiness and finding peace and how that is a skill like all of those things are stuff that i'm interested in for for myself as subjects right so 
it was, it's just as much that like he was sharing what he was interested in. And I was like over and over again, like, man, this guy gets it. Like he's, you know, 10 years ahead of like what I'm interested in and studying. And so his kind of like f looking at his path and looking at the stuff that he was distilling and sharing was super interesting to me. And I got a lot out of it. Um, and so when I just kind of, you know, as this stuff kept going and kept coming and kept coming, I started thinking more like, you know, he's sharing all this amazing stuff, but it's in Twitter and it's in podcasts and it's just like, you know, disappear in a few years like that stuff tends to have a shorter shelf mm. life and books you know are just this medium that's been with us forever and it kind of as soon as it's in a book it feels like it's gonna stick around forever and everybody knows what to do with a book um and people gift books in ways that they don't you know share podcasts and things like that as often and not everybody listens to podcasts not everybody's on twitter um but everybody either reads or knows what to do with a book. And so getting, uh, transforming this into something that was more accessible and more permanent and more um, evergreen and easier to access and that they could, you know, flip through table of contents, reference, read, gift, share, leave on your nightstand. Like it just felt like the right way to kind of carry these ideas forward to make them more accessible to more people. No, that's, that's beautiful. Could you give my listeners context on his story what, like behind like the brain what what did the guy do like as in when he was a teenager when he was a college student when he was a young entrepreneur what was his life like yeah he's, he's had an interesting life he um emigrated from delhi to uh brooklyn new york at like age nine i think um and single parent house you know is Dad wasn't really around. His dad's degree didn't transfer, but he's like, you know, single mom working two jobs with him and his brother. And so he kind of had a pretty independent childhood, it sounds like. Um, you know, spent a lot of time in the library, reading a lot of books, studying, had some menial jobs, he's, you know, catering and washing dishes and delivery that kind of um, helped the family. And then as he was getting into high school, um, He's clearly like very kind of naturally brilliant and he spent all this time in the library and learned a lot. And so he's like passed this test to get into this relatively elite high school. Um, and once he was in that high school, he got into Dartmouth um, and started, so it was an Ivy League school, it's a great school, he started studying computer science and economics. And from there, you know, it, it looked like a few adventures early in, the, in his careers, like started with a law firm and like didn't really like that culture and work and, um, started off as a software engineer um, and, and then just kind of got more and more into tech and tried a few different things, started a few companies in like, uh, started one in the early 2000s. It was part of like the early dot-com boom and was um, basically cheated out of it by a, a co-founder and that turned into a little bit of a legal battle. So that was like an almost win and then a crushing loss and that turned contentious and then he became an investor. Um, and it wasn't until, you know, he it has some great investments, uh, but those take a long time to, to percolate, you know, invested in Twitter, in an Uber, Postmates, um, started a fund and then started blogging through Venture Hacks, which turned into uh, AngelList, which has now this beautiful, incredible platform that, you know, has investments and job listings and like, you know, is, is the website that Silicon Valley takes place on basically like investments get through there and jobs go through there. So there's this um, kind of huge body of work now, but it took, you know, decades of like putting pieces together and taking small steps and making small investments and um, sort of building this this credibility and this reputation. And um, it, it's it's kind of incredible now to look at you know, the principles that he shares and see how he's been applying them for years and years and years. Um, but I, I wouldn't say it was a um, an easy path um, or a clear one even. Yeah, and he's someone who's worked on his craft. And if you listen to his podcast, even though he did one with Tim Ferriss recently, he spoke about two very interesting concepts. One, he said that his his fire comes from his process of learning, uh, which is what he's working towards. He, he earned money in order to be free. And in that free time, he thinks about things, he learns. That's why he's called the modern world's philosopher. Like he's he probably will go down uh, in the same way that, you know, you look back at Aristotle or you look back at, you know, there's a bunch of Indian philosophers in our culture. He, he'll go down uh, as one of those guys, according to me, because he's that hungry for, for the, his learning process. And purely in terms of wealth, he said something really cool. He said that, I don't look for massive cash outs. Mm -hmm. I just want to ensure that 
I I keep making a little bit of money as my life is progressing and that making that little bit of money teaches me formulas and I just keep reapplying and reworking those same formulas and therefore I compound and I accumulate wealth which is something that a lot of young people probably all over the world need to understand everyone's chasing that massive splash of money that massive explosion when really the game is about setting fire running away coming back setting fire again running away and chilling while you're you're running there because the goal of life isn't money it's also happiness Yeah and and you can't uh you know you can't dedicate a entire chapter of your life to like I'm just going to spend this 10 years only making money as a recipe for misery and in your relationships fall apart and your health falls apart and you see that like in the valley probably to a fall you know um of people just overly focused on accomplishing one thing at a time in their life instead of finding balance and finding principles and finding ways to keep everything like working together well and and um make progress on wealth make progress in your relationships and, and keep your inner peace and um keep your health and in a good spot and so finding all of those things um but yeah even even for somebody who's in a hit driven business like investing and startups you know exactly what you're saying he says this didn't come in one big splash this is you know a lot of chips stacking up time over time over time you know stuff like chainlink is getting better at interacting like between the blockchain and the real world um and so some of those things are kind of frontier i think um that he's that he's still investing in and of course angelus is still doing like you know new and exciting things they just rolled out um rolling funds and so that kind of changes the dynamic between uh angel investors and their lps which changes the amount of capital available to entrepreneurs um and so there's still innovations mm-hmm. happening like on just you know how the plumbing of the you know startup ecosystem and the investing and um you know that just keeps every year they just keep getting more and more money flowing into tech startups as, as and we just keep seeing the market grow and more and more successes we get more and more investment and that the cycle just keeps running so eric uh, i'm going to have to ask you to explain to a 4 year old the basic concept of blockchain and cryptocurrencies how would you explain that okay forget to a 4 year old but what's your what's your simplest explanation of it to someone who doesn't understand it at all i'm i'm totally the wrong guy for this um but i'll i'll do okay, my, i'll okay. do i'll do my best um which is that the the blockchain is a mathematically secured ledger of transactions. So that wouldn't that wouldn't work okay. for a 4-year-old, but basically like imagine an accounting state <laughs> an accounting statement um uh, that's public that cannot be falsified. Um and so all transactions mm-hmm. back and forth, you know, the analogy that um Naval uses for Bitcoin is like imagine one perfectly impenetrable Swiss bank account shared by all of humanity. that has like a fixed size and so if you want to store assets in it you can store assets in it um but we are all pulling we are all giving to and pulling from the same pool and so if you need to store assets in it you have to buy an asset from somebody who already has or buy the space from somebody who already has an asset in it um you know there's there's a I did a compilation of of Naval's sort of summaries of blockchain and crypto on the website so you can read it in his own words rather than relying on my uh my imperfect recollection um for people who want to <laughs> want to kind of dive into that um but it's it is a very interesting world um and and I like Naval takes the kind of foundations of crypto and merges it with um a lot of like the ideas from sapiens you know you all know Harari that you were mentioning earlier and combines those and really looks at blockchain and crypto as a new way to organize human effort um so like at the highest mm. level you know we use political systems to organize humans and and govern we use markets to organize humans and reallocate resources and in the same way we can the blockchain can be used as the system to transact you know and organize human effort and reallocate resources um if the rules are set the blockchain can execute them and we can all operate in a without necessarily even having to trust each other or upon relationships because the blockchain like forces trust and security in those in those relationships even if people don't know each other. Um and so I think there's a really mm. interesting uh vision of the world that can come from imagining what does it look like to remove the need of trust between any transaction like you know how does it work you know that's what we were talking about earlier like how can remote people get access to work that they've never done before um in that is based on a relationship that they don't have like the blockchain may remove the need of that if 
all of the blockchain is doing. It's like, hey, you need to perform this task, and if you do, you'll get this reward. The trust doesn't matter. Mm. The you know the relationship doesn't matter. Like through if a blockchain uh, sort of is extended all throughout um, all of the like gifts and rewards of executing a task, um, you can imagine they, they call them like uh, decentralized autonomous organizations. And it's just like, mm. it views the firm, a company as a nexus of contracts. And those contracts can be executed through a blockchain automatically in a trustless way. And all of the independent kind of parties that plug into a company can just like opt in or out of any particular task or any particular job or role or responsibility. Um, continuously, completely fluidly in a perfectly liquid way. And that's a really interesting, you know, we're a ways from that, but it's a really interesting like vision for the world. And as you think through the second and third order effects of that, it's, um, it's pretty incredible. So a human being earns money or does things in this world primarily to take care of his family and live a happy life. So from that perspective, how does the concept of cryptocurrencies change your existence as a basic human being? Like how will it change? an average person's life in Nigeria or New Zealand or Latvia, you know, like how will it just change a, a normal person's life? Yeah, I, I think the, the cryptocurrency um, sort of wave can really reduce the differences between uh, people living in different countries, like political systems and borders uh, become much less important um, because countries aren't as insular in how they do business and business and relationships are less dependent on who is the nearest. And so the, the world becomes much more flat um, with like a cryptocurrency and blockchain driven world. Um, individual currencies, individual governments become less powerful and the world becomes much more of a meritocracy. Um, so the best person mm. for a particular job, it's easier for them to find it, it's easier for them to get it, it's easier for them to get paid doing it, rather than you know some of the challenges of international business today like are gonna be dramatically reduced as, as cryptocurrency makes it easier um, and just kind of creates one, um, one whole lot of humanity online and makes it easier for us to cooperate basically it's, it's a new form of human cooperation that, that transcends governments um, and just makes markets significantly more efficient and more um, reduces some of the friction that comes with uh, the need for trust and the need for a pre-existing relationship so the effective answer is that it takes power away from the government and gives power to the people who are doing the transactions, the businessmen or the shopkeepers or whatever. Yeah, it increases liquidity in, in the global labor market, I think, which means that every individual is going to have more jobs available to them at any given time, right? More opportunities. Um, it, it's, it's much more of a meritocracy. Um, which means the returns for being the best at what you do or even great at what you do are much higher. And it matters less where you mm. are or who you are or how old you are. Um, it matters much more like how good you are at a certain thing and how important that thing is that you are good at, right? Which is possibly why governments might be against the use of cryptocurrencies going forward because they might realize that, oh shit, we're not, we're losing power to like these tech people or these entrepreneurs and might create some roadblocks in the path of cryptocurrencies. Yeah, I imagine it'll make it harder to collect taxes. It'll make it harder to keep, to retain citizens. If a government is not, um, if a citizen is not happy with the government, it'll make it easier for them to like, well, I'm just gonna put all my assets in, in like the blockchain somewhere in Bitcoin and I'm gonna get over a border and I'm gonna collect them again. And um, it, it'll be much easier to transfer between countries, which means countries will have to compete for the best citizens much more, uh, maybe much more effectively than they do now. Right, you know, so say in the year 1999, no one thought that within 20 years, we're gonna have a television, a bank, a, an, a photo album, a camera, every all of that and much more inside one small device that can fit in your pocket. So 1999, that was the perspective. 2019, that perspective was, oh shit, this happened. This is what our life is like now. So I feel like in the human story, especially as we're moving forward, there's going to be these massive technological advancements because of which the human experience suddenly becomes way different than it was even five, 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And this is probably that next jump 
where because of remote work becoming a possibility because of how, what Nawal Ravikant said about code and content are the future so if you are capable of creating code or content you'll be all right financially going forward mm -hmm. you know uh, these are the new skills required of the world and possibly cryptocurrencies uh, will be the form of payment will be the new gold in many ways uh, is that is that fair to say that probably by 2040 we're going to be living in a very different world where I don't look at you and I say, okay, you're an American or so-and-so is a Chinese or so-and-so is Ethiopian. I just say, okay, you're a human. You need me to do this. You pay me through crypto. I'll do the service for you extremely well. And then we'll work together long term based on you giving me my salary in cryptocurrencies or, or vice versa. Yeah, I think that's I think that's a very reasonable vision for especially for the tech world, right? Like this is not going to be true universally. You know, if you're a contractor and your job is to build buildings, it's going to be much harder for you to kind of transition into like a digital world. But for the people who are living most of their lives digitally, their digital relationships, the digital work, you know, they just need a laptop and they can be anywhere in the world and you know have their whole life with them and everything that they need to perform their craft and do their business. Um, you know, it's not going to be true for everybody, but it's going to be increasingly, um, increasingly true for the digital, you know, the people who kind of live digitally, um, and, and those lives may diverge much more quickly than people who are, you know, doing a job or responsibilities that fix them to a certain place or, um, you know, the physical world or the governmental world. Um, so for some people change will happen radically and quickly. And for others, you know, it may not happen at all, or it'll only sort of tangentially affect their lives. Right. Uh, in fact, in 21 Lessons for the 21st Century, Yuval Noah Harari says something beautiful. He says that borders, like a country's borders, are a very new concept for mankind. Hmm. These things didn't exist earlier. Everything was pretty much a bunch of similar people in one area, and we call ourselves Indians or we call ourselves Japanese or whatever but borders as a concept is a very he he actually I think in a part of the book he kind of looked down on the concept of borders he said that probably for this 200 300 year phase of human history borders have become really important but going forward borders are also going to disappear again and I do feel that cryptocurrencies are a massive part of that change that's going to happen. He also had a whole chapter on patriotism where he said that patriotism is basically a tool used by governing bodies to control mass populations and mass thought processes. Now, if I say that on a podcast, I'm sure I'm going to get hate from people saying, hey, are you saying you're not patriotic? No, I love my culture. I love India. I love what India has given me. Yeah. But it's just a nice concept to think of, you know, that patriotism is a way for governments to tell you, oh shit, you're not thinking this way? That means you're a bad Japanese person, or you're a bad Ethiopian, or you're a bad Nigerian, or you're a bad Indian, or you're a bad American. So it's just some fun concepts to think of. And I feel like that's why it's also important to read books, because it just opens up your mind in ways that you didn't expect. Yeah, Noel has a, a helpful kind of tool for that, where he says um, you should be suspect of any uh, beliefs that you got in a package. So if it comes with, you know, <laughs> you're an American, you're supposed to believe you know, one, two, three, you're a Catholic, you're supposed to believe one, two, three, you know, you're a Buddhist, you're supposed to believe one, two, three, like anything that someone is handing you a bundle, like you've got to learn to unbundle those and select the beliefs that maybe serve you. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think like the government certainly wants us to think and act in certain ways that makes us easy to govern and good citizens, but it's also like our culture sets that. I, I don't think that it's like a puppet master thing so much as like there are cultural norms that we are all held to and by our community and the people around us because we need to rely on each other. We need to have a set of, you know, cooperation rules and expectations so that we can um, kind of effectively collaborate and work together as humans to like accomplish things and, um, you know, use each other's skills and gifts and abilities and support each other. Like that's, um, there's, there's nothing insidious about that, I don't think. Yeah. Have you heard of this guy called Russell Peters? He's a stand up comic. He says that eventually the whole world is going to become beige. Like everything's just <laughs> going to become one thing. Like we're all just going to become one kind of race, which is very true. Like that's what I strongly believe. And in many ways, it's not just yeah. biologically, all of us are going to have sex with each other. It's also exactly what we spoke about that you can work with anyone, whether they're sitting in Hawaii or Fiji or wherever they are in the world, Russia, you'll, you'll kind of feel a oneness. And also, I mean, I do have a very spiritual aspect of my life and even the world of yoga, the world of spirituality predicts that for the following 
two or three centuries that we're probably going to live in a much more unified world because people are going to become much more connected through globalization therefore have much more perspective therefore become much more empathetic and therefore kind of look at themselves as one and not look at oh you're a pakistani i'm an indian i'm supposed to hate you so i hate you everyone's going to look at humans as humans yeah i'm i'm really rooting for some sort of alien invasion that just unifies humanity <laughs> i feel like that's going to really bring us all together Yeah yeah for sure so because you're into sci-fi is there anything you'd like to highlight about the next 10 to 20 years that people would assume is from a sci-fi novel but in truth it's already here for example flying cars or you know even hyperloop is pretty sci-fi according to me but yeah. uh, i mean is there anything you want to highlight specifically i mean the hyperloop is co- is really cool um i mean that's just an exciting one like there are flying cars they're just like really not that practical um like i can't imagine the amount of like regulations and danger and i don't know um it's a like the the tunnels that uh the boring company that Elon's working on too is like a pretty cool thing um i think there's probably the like breakout thing that's going to change our society the most we may not know yet um or it's maybe like a fringe of ai uh i mean the the gpt3 like experiment i don't know if you've seen that but that is like No, no. Pretty close to it, it is a huge I think it's um I think it's a Google AI project and you feed in like inputs so you could take like my whole Twitter history, give it to it and say give me 100 more tweets and like at least half of those you probably would not be able to tell are from a robot or from an AI. And so there's like if you wow. look if you look these up you can start to see it's still expensive, you know, it takes a lot of computing power to do it, but we are we are seeing AI that is already kind of at least in in moments like able to fool us. I think there's um there's definitely like video and photo things that are uh very very close to the real thing enough to fool people like deep fakes. Um so you look up deep fakes yeah. and see some of those and that is like predictably improving to the point yeah. where like just hold, hold up i just got to give the listeners context deep fakes is basically they'll uh, say you know you really like sharukh khan so sharukh khan has a lot of photos available on google.com uh, an ai device will go scan all the photos and kind of create a 3d version of his face and therefore be able to plaster that 3d version of shahrukh khan's face onto any video so you can have a video of say donald trump giving a speech but it will look like shahrukh khan's talking with donald trump's voice and i'm sure that they're going to do this for shahrukh khan's voice as well as in they'll probably be able to generate someone's voice as well at some point which also means that um you'll be able to take a human being's data like their face their voice their body language everything about them and create an animated false version of them which looks feels and thinks completely realistically but go on eric yeah I, that is uh, i think they already can do voice at least to some extent if they have a lot of recordings of a person so like you can go on and get like you you can basically like we are not too far from someone being able to completely fabricate a believable video of someone saying something you know that they never said um which is going mm. to really change how we have to as individuals like react and and like verify information and like you can imagine that being used for a lot of you know not great political nefarious purposes um and it being used against private citizens and it, it's going to be a really interesting um that that's something like the technology is already there it's just not very widely distributed yet and that'll be a real mm. change to like it, it's something that like people need to know about so that we are not totally taken by surprise by it um if we see it mm. cuz i can imagine the, some of the first versions of that when this information is not widely known can be catastrophic for people yeah i'm i'm thinking i'm going to call this podcast why humanity is fucked going forward <laughs> but anyway <laughs> I, I, i thought we were so, being a little uh, optimistic we're we're choosing positive <laughs> So so here's here's my brotherly share of data with you. Um I don't know whether it's human culture or Indian culture, but 5 years of content creation has taught me that if you want to generate clicks on a particular piece of content, if you package it in a negative tone or mm. if you if your first bit of the content where most of your users end up leaving most content pieces in your first 10 20 seconds but your first 10 to 20 seconds are either negative or th- extremely thought provoking 
which often you know if if your if your thought is negative it it, it automatically becomes thought provoking so uh, if if you have a negative kind of cover on the book then people stick it on for the entire book so that's just the curse of content creation not just in india that's a rule all over yeah. the world but it works even more in india and a lot of media houses like we have this news channel called india tv it's our equivalent of i think fox news for you guys yeah. you know where um, you, you know what i mean yeah. right like uh, people so uh, yeah exactly <laughs> sort of it's it's something like that uh, and uh, uh they've they've primarily grown based on packaging even neutral or positive content in a negative way so but i i think this is more a human thing than just an indian thing anyway yeah. go on you were saying no something. no I, i mean i agree i think it's an unfortunate there's um there's a book called uh contagious i think that is uh examines like what content gets shared and what are the emotional right. like triggers that that uh content creators have to hit in order to get content shared and there's there are positive ones but there are also like very reliable negative ones that are like outrage you know um yeah like shame shuts people down but outrage gets them to share and signal like that they disagree with it and that they think that it's wrong and um <laughs> so it, yeah it's a very like um it's an insidious thing and i think like it's a shame because we, when we reward when we as like viewers reward content creators for leading with negative things we get more of that and then we all suffer yeah. for it um and, and it's you know yeah. something that i filter for when we were talking about like how we choose our twitter feed and the people that we want to interact with like my favorite people are pretty unfailingly either optimistic or or neutral you know they they don't seek the negative perspective on things they don't take the worst possible interpretation um you know those are i, I think uh it's hard enough to always remember that you can choose a positive interpretation as yourself that if you surround yourself with people who are doing the same or if you take in media that's always doing the same it is really uh it, that gets much harder yeah for sure um so you know i wanted to talk to you about this concept of leverage as well not just in terms of content or career but leverage is something you speak about a lot generally with your brand uh could you explain the word leverage to someone who doesn't understand it like in very simple words and could you kind of expand on what you've learned about the concept of leverage over your own career yeah devol will kind of introduce this idea and i i totally fell in love with it i think there's so much more to kind of explore here um leverage the most kind of high level definition is just a force multiplier um and so the forces that you, you on a personal level might want to multiply you know your judgment the decisions that you make um your effort your skills uh the the methods of leverage are things like tools labor capital uh and and product you know media code productization uh things like that so um as you look at the kind of inputs um whether it's a decision that you're making an investment or you know the work that you're putting into something um and you want to get a much you know a 10x output you've got to find ways to leverage that input. And so, you know, if you have $1000 and you're trying to make an investment, um, you know, you might earn 10,000, but if you can get $10,000 to make that same investment, that same decision, then you might make 100,000. It's a very, very different outcome and that capital is providing leverage to create a much larger outcome from the exact same initial motion. Um, you get the same leverage from from labor, from, you know, hiring so, people to help yeah. you and work with you. Imagine that anything you're doing in your life is done with the help of a knife. Leverage is your process of sharpening that knife to do everything in your life. Yeah, you know, tools is probably the most basic version. If I sent you out in the woods to chop down a tree with your bare hands, it would take you a really long time. Um and if I gave you an axe, it would take you a little less long. And if I gave you a chainsaw, it would take you even less time. Um and if we sent you out there mm. with like five people and a giant machine you could do 100 trees in the same amount of time so it, it is really looking at you know what are your skills what are you trying to accomplish how can you amass and use all of the different types of leverage available to you it, it, this podcast is a great example i know you got people around you right now with different skills contributing their time to helping this podcast come together once it's in a product mm. now it's now it's in a package it's in you know saved in the cloud it's in a podcast and now people in the future you know whether it's tomorrow or in 5 years can listen to this and can replay us anytime they want to we are we are packaging and using leverage on our own time right now um in in an incredible mm. way 
that was that has never been mm. true before. You know, leverage used to be let me get it in front of an auditorium in front of a hundred people, and now it's let me record a podcast and ten thousand people can listen to this. Like that's that's absolutely mm. incredible. Um, and these new technologies are giving us new, longer forms of leverage. And so, small content businesses, um, in particular, and software businesses are so much more profitable and so much more high leverage than any other you know, businesses in the past had an opportunity to be just because of the, the leverage that technology is providing. So, um, you know, again, because you're someone who studies Naval, because you're someone who studies happiness and human existence, what do you think works as leverage for your own happiness? For me, it's my practice of meditation, my practice of learning through people like yourself, my practice of going deeper into the world of spirituality, spiritual learnings. That's that's what works for me on a personal level. And while I understand there may not be one answer that fits everyone, but what, what do you think is a general way to um, use leverage to enhance your own happiness levels? Yeah, I think um, the way I've been thinking about this recently is uh, trying to think really hard about what are the things that only we can do for ourselves, right? So you cannot outsource your breathing, you know, you cannot outsource the controlling like your inner voice, you can't outsource your your workouts. Um, so there's things that you can get people to help with, there's things that you can safely ignore, there's things that you can um, do without in life. Uh, and it's, it's hard to build the habit of, of learning to do the things that are good for you and the things that do make you happy, um, even in the medium term. Like, it's so much easier to just like open your phone and get a quick hit of dopamine and then to remember like, I'll actually feel better if I go to the gym, if I go to go on a walk, <laughs> if I just go get out in nature, if I go listen to the waves, um, if I go have coffee with a friend, like all of those things will make me happier than the like dopamine in five seconds that I can get. Um, and there are things that like, you know, it doesn't feel better to have someone else do it for me. You know, so, some of the work can be shared, some of the responsibilities can be shared, um, but remembering and learning those habits so that you can uh, take care of yourself and, and be sure that you're, you know, giving yourself the space and um, the appreciation almost that, that you deserve. Um, you know, it's, it's so easy to get yourself in a place where you like, you think that the more unhappy you are with yourself and the, the harder you are on yourself, the better you're gonna do and the more productive you'll be. Um, you know, I, I still catch myself doing this all the time and it's, it's not true. It's not helpful to be, um, you know, to be hard on yourself, to, to punish yourself, to, to postpone your own happiness, thinking that you're going to get more done in the meantime, you'd be better off just allowing yourself to be happy doing what you're doing and only do things that, that make you happy, you know, find ways to, to make progress and enjoy your time at the same time. And, and, um, mm. th th those are things that take a while to, give yourself permission to do. Um, but once you've kind of flipped that switch and once you've learned to ask yourself these questions and evaluate, you know, I'm sure you're, uh, you're enjoying this time and the work that you do, you're making progress and enjoying yourself at the same time. Um, yeah, much more than you would if you were, you know, I don't know, practicing corporate law or something, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> yeah. My, my first internship in college was this internship at Ernst and Young, fantastic work culture and all that. But I'd yeah. enter that office with the intention of leaving. I'd, I'd think to myself, oh shit, I gotta be here for like nine hours at least. And I, that's when I realized, oh man, this is not the career I want for myself. And the moment I ever came in front of the camera for the first time, I realized, oh, this is this is something that speaks naturally to me. Yeah, so, you, you saw how uh, that's, good that's, you that's... look. You were like, I'm feeling myself in here. This is great. <laughs> Something like that. It, there's just things that come naturally to you, you know, whether that's career choices or systems that you kind of apply within your own life. You've got to keep experimenting. That's that's my two cents on leverage. That throughout your life, you're changing as a person, even when you're turning 29, even when you're turning 30. But you've got to keep your experimentation on because maybe the 30-year-old version of yourself will want different things from the 28-year-old version of yourself. So just as long as you keep your experimentation alive, my uh, hypothesis is that by the time you're like 40, maybe you're not, you know, your energy slightly lower, your head's not working as rapidly. You're also much more sorted out from a career perspective and you have time for self-actualization. You'll have your systems in place after years of experimentation and understanding yourself. So you've got to get to the core of who you are. Yeah, I, I think um, maybe the, the way that this was said before that stuck with me the most, that Peter Kaufman said this, he's like, if, if you saw a child 
uh, who was seven and they didn't change between age seven and age 10, it would be a tragedy. It, like it'd be a very noticeable, painful, something, something is wrong. Um, but if you don't change between 27 and 30, it's almost expected. It's almost expected that adults don't change. And the people around us actually like almost subconsciously encourage us to stay the same. They want us to be predictable. They want us to, um, to not change too much because it's inconvenient for people around us and it's, it's hard and it's hard for us and you can only change so many things at once. And, and some of those are, um, that, that sticks in mind to me. I was like, if you don't change, it's a, it's a tragedy. There's always something you can, you can grow. There's always something that's going to be important to add. There's always, you know, your context is changing, even if what the system and the self that you had was perfect for, you know, where and who you were at 27, where and who you are at 30 is going to be different. And you've got to change and grow mm. and adjust to that. So, you know, Eric, you're someone who has a stable career. You're someone who learns a lot. Therefore, I'm pretty sure you're someone who's also calm most of the time. On a very personal level, I'd like to ask you, do you, if you even have any void in your life, like on a very personal level, do you feel that there's anything that's incomplete for you after this much of learning and this much analysis? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is a thing that I like. Um, it is it is really hard to uh, not just look at the gap between who you are and who you want to be. Right. Um, mm. And the, and the, you always you, you kind of have this. Um, it's really easy to lock in expectations for yourself and to um, very quickly pick up new desires and pick up new hopes. You know, it's, it's easy to go scroll Instagram for 20 minutes and you come out thinking like, oh my God, I want to cook like Anthony Bourdain and I want to be like a super wise, balanced philosopher and I want to travel the world and I want to, you know, lift until I look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. And like, you just have all these like expectations of yourself that pile up that are, when you when you look at the mountain of expectations and desires that you set for yourself wildly unreasonable you know like if someone told you that those were all their goals you'd be like you're crazy um but it, it, you don't always see that you're doing it you don't always like evaluate the whole pile you just pick them up one at a time and throw them on your like desire list um and then you wonder why you're like unhappy with with who you are or you're like, you know, the void, you know, you're like, oh, I'm, I'm not, I'm not where I want to be. Um, and to anybody, uh, any of your friends, any of your family, and it, you know, they're kind of like, what are you talking about? Like you're in a great spot. Things are, things are like, you've accomplished great things. And, um, but we all have expectations of ourselves, you know, that, that's what's drawing us along that are, that are farther ahead than where we are now. Um, and you know, the, the thing, um, uh, a trainer told me this is like it's, you're you're very it's very hard to love yourself and change yourself at the same time you know like mm. you, you've got a um you can't in order to change yourself you almost um instinctively like start disliking who you are and where you are and that sometimes can be a force for motivation and sometimes a force of change but it also causes you pain every day until you see that change and, and you can have both, you know, you can love yourself for who you are and want to change at the same time. You don't have to choose one or the other. Um, it's hard work to, to balance that, you know, it's like walking a tightrope, uh, psychologically, but, um, it's possible to do both. And I think, you know, that's, I want to spend my life both loving who I am and growing and changing at the same time. And so it, it is worth building that skill and working hard to, get on that tightrope and learn to kind of keep walking it. Is that why you study Nawal in detail so much? Because he's, he, at least from the outside, it looks like he's achieved that, you know, he's happy with himself. And at the same time, he's comfortably growing. Yeah, that, that's partly what drew me to him. And uh, I think um, the interesting thing is that he, it took him a, many years to get there, right? Like, um, he says, you know, that he was very hard on himself and very unhappy for most of the time when he was building his wealth and building his career and earlier in his life. Um, and now that he is, you know, established and wealthy and has his company and has his investments and has his portfolio, he's now turning to like philosophy a little bit more and finding happiness. But, um, the core kind of question that we are left with is like, could he have done what he did and have been happy at the same time? Um, cause he, he didn't, um, but I think that we can, and it helps to study things, to look past like 
um, you know, I know I've given this, this book as a gift to friends who are, you know, in their early twenties and they read the wealth section, you know, 10, 20 times and the happiness section once or twice. Um, and, and I think if you look, if you look at your whole life earlier and holistically and start to look at some of the philosophy a little bit earlier, you can inculcate some of those ideas and you can make progress. You can grow yourself and love yourself at the same time. Um, but it, it takes work to reach beyond, you know, that just having that one maniacal goal that you're focused on and s seeing the whole, your whole self and your whole life for what it is and trying to kind of put it all together. Gorgeous. And uh, I mean, I got to ask you about the career side of leverage as well, sure. because I also feel that, you know, the curse of being an entrepreneur or working in startup related environments is this problem that we just spoke of that we're always trying to get to that next step without being kind to ourselves. It's that Michael Jordan shit, you know, like you keep, keep working at the cost of <laughs> yeah. holding in all the steers and then crying once you win the championship. Yeah. But, uh, from a career perspective, what have you learned about leverage? Like, uh, you know, how can you use leverage to enhance your career progress? Yeah, I, I think leverage, um, the, the first question to ask yourself that kind of sets you down the path is like, what are for each each one of us each individual what are my highest value tasks you know what are the things that only i can do or what are the very best uses of my time and so if you could only accomplish one task this week what would it be if you could only um spend two hours on your company this week what are the two what are the things that you would do in those two hours um and, and you may actually like have a really interesting answer to this like do, do you know like is your time spent interviewing guests the most high leverage use of your time. It's the thing that no one else can replace you with doing, right? Yeah, uh, it's exactly this. And you know, it's not just me recording content. I'm learning through every podcast. Right. Uh, and you know, people who don't know the brand think that I'm just running a podcast. But honestly, these are my, this is my higher degrees, this is my higher education, this is my yeah. MBA that I'm doing through people like yourself. I take that information, I sit with it, I probably research, I read. And then I relay it to my junior team, my business development team and say that, okay, you know, this is this information. This is what we can create with this information. So please go and create shit. And then they go and create shit, come back to me. I review it and I, I green light or red light it based on uh, how good or bad it is. But yeah. then my process has to be focused on being the face of things and learning at the same time for the sake of the team. Yeah. So your, your, your high leverage tasks are the interviews themselves your learning, which you can't, you can't outsource your learning. You can get help, you can get input, but like you can't substitute yourself for taking in the information. And it sounds like your, your taste, you know, you set the quality bar in your organization. You, you decide what goes and what doesn't. Um, and so those are, you know, those are your highest leverage tasks, the things that only you can do. And you've got people who help you with editing and people who help you with promotion, people who help you with repackaging and merchandising and people who help you book book guests and you know all of those things are things that you get help with so that you can keep doing the super high value high leverage things you see it in you know a senior accountant will have an assistant and will have you know somebody who helps on the hr side of things and somebody who's like working the back office doing you know tasks that are so if you look at people who are are leveraged you'll see that they spend the most of their time on jobs that only they can do and they get help either through tools or products or um, systems or, you know, it just, they, they freely spend money and resources so that they can stay focused on the high value tasks and, and build systems around them. So they're standing on this like mountain of levers, you know, and, and controlling a lot of things around them through their judgment and their skill uh, that they built over the course of their career. Hmm. So um, if you had to, like, I mean, I know it's very difficult for you because you're someone who studies a bunch of subjects, but if you are to highlight three uh, lessons about the world, it could be leverage, it could be the future of business, it could be the future of the world. What would you like to share with all the listeners for the sake of the 2020s? Mm. I think, um, I think I would, I would start with the idea internally that like, you know, we all control our own experience. You know, you, no one can control your perception of events except for you. And, and that is kind of the foundation of everything. 
Um, that That is, you know, old, old wisdom, but it's something that everybody needs to kind of learn for themselves and learn maybe thousands of times over um, and continually learn. So that's, that's a timeless thing. That's maybe not 2020s, but it's everybody's got to do it. Um, I think uh, compounding is one of the most powerful sort of mental models that exists and understanding the results of, of thinking long-term um, in relationships and in investments and in careers and in skills, you know, take as long-term of a perspective as you can. And that doesn't mean delay action. You know, one of my favorite things from Naval is um, impatience with action, patience with results. And I think that turns that turns the idea of compounding into, you know, a mantra that you can use every day. So you've got to get your workout in. You've got to get your work done. You've got to read the next book. Impatience with that next action, but get patience with the results. Allow time for the investments to, to grow. Allow time for, you know, the savings to build up. Allow time for the skills and the perspectives to build up. And uh, I mean, the third, I would I would say leverage, but we, we've talked about that um, a fair a fair <laughs> bit already. Um, and I think uh, maybe maybe the last one that I, that I'd sub in instead then um, is just that like happiness. There's maybe two schools of happiness, and one is is you're completely independent and you need to control your own perspective and choose happiness. And the other is that you know we are social animals, and you know some of the most long and high investment happiness studies come down to like the quality of your relationships. Um, and as we we're talking about leverage and things that you cannot outsource and things that you must do for yourself, like maintaining healthy, positive, close relationships with friends, with partners, with family, um, you can't outsource that. You can't ignore it. Um, you know, in the same way with, with your health and everything else. And, and that is going to be, um, you know, a source of, of esteem and of, pride and of peace and of calm and um they're really gonna i think help you and and things you'll find rewarding you know over over your whole life eric jorgensen thank you for being on the runway show brother i really appreciate you sharing all your wisdom and i hope that someone ends up writing an almanac on you as well (laughs) uh Thank you for what you've shared with the world, man. I really hope that this reaches maximum listeners. Uh, This one, one and a half hour conversation is extremely value adding, uh, especially from a modern world context. So really from the bottom of my heart, thank you for teaching me. Thank you for sharing it with uh, my audience. Thanks for having me. It's, It's super fun. I'm glad to be here. For sure. Thank you, brother. I'm going to be linking all of Eric's handles down below, guys. Make sure you go follow. Make sure you go uh, tweet out to him if you want a job. No, don't do that. (laughs) But uh, Eric will probably be back on the Ranveer show at some point. That would be awesome. You're the man. That's a great interview. Thank you so much. I appreciate it.